Okay, we've had some really, really good presentations. Uh, and it's now time for the Q&A. And, and John, please come and, and join us. I think that's a good idea, yeah. Uh, do we have any questions? Yeah, uh, pl please go to the microphone. Uh, please identify yourself and then ask the question. Yes, uh, my name is Chiara Manzi. I come from uh, Italy. I teach uh, culinary medicine in uh, uh, Ferrara University in Italy. Um, I um, uh, I've been working uh, since uh, 15 years in uh, substituting sugar and uh, help people to enjoy a uh, dessert uh, without um, harm harming <laughs> the the uh, head. And uh, I usually uh, use erythritol to substitute uh, sugar. Uh, in your studies, uh, you don't uh, uh, nominate any non uh, any alcoholic um, sweeteners. Uh, so I, I wanted to know why uh, you don't nominate you don't uh, uh, study erythritol, and uh, what do you think about it? Thank you for raising this question. Well, no particular reason, actually. Uh, some people are not very happy with sugar alcohols in their digestive system. That could be one reason for avoiding them. We are running this sweet trial now, and some, some are really not happy with that. It gives them bloating and discomfort. But otherwise, I, um, no specific reason for, our, for my case, at least. I, I couldn't hear what you said now in the last. <laughs> She's saying there's no positive evidence for erythritol. Is there evidence to review? Thank you. I beg your pardon for my English, first no, of all. Uh, I wanted to, I understood that, that uh, there are not positive evidence for uh, 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 alcoholic sweeteners, but also for erythritol, because erythritol is very different from the others. I know, and thanks for the question. We, I mean, if ours was really pragmatic. We were focused on beverages um, where yes. sugar alcohols aren't used. Um, yes. So really we're interested in, and we weren't, I mean, we did in the one review that wasn't commissioned that was a follow-up looking at the biological plausibility. We looked at all the available sweetener data and we did focus on the high intensity sweeteners since they have had most of the attention, but yeah, it wasn't really a, a specific reason beyond that. It was more just practical consideration. We just wanted to focus on beverages as the main the main source. Okay. And uh, last, uh, I wanted to know what uh, you mean by um, low digestibility sugars. What are low digestibility sugars? The, it was in one of, of your slides. Well, that was Jenny Brand Miller that, come, that came from her, so I'm not quite sure what she meant exactly. Okay. Why? Why can I ask you a question? <laughs> it it was written in your in yes. Your... It was a comment from Jenny Brand Miller, copied directly from from the comments. Okay. Um, why are you so interested in a retrotol? Uh, can you explain why that? I yes. am I interested? Why you use it that much? Uh, I use retrotol because um, it, it's uh, less uh, um, uh, it's less sweet than uh, sugar. So uh, our uh, desserts are not so sweet, so they don't cause uh, the um, dependence to the um, to the taste of the of the sweet. You eat one, and that's it. You don't have the uh, the desire to eat more. First of all, second, erythritol uh, doesn't convert in sugar in our body, like maltitol. Xylitol and all the other non-alcoholic sweeteners. Uh, erythritol uh, has a very different metabolic uh, way uh, and uh, doesn't convert in uh, in uh, in sugar. And uh, there are more um, lot of evidence that uh, observe an antioxidant effect effect in humans 
when uh, we use erythritol. And uh, another uh, reason is that uh, you can uh, use erythritol uh, in the same uh, quantity of sugar. So uh, you can uh, uh, use uh, this um, uh, substitute also for uh, the best um, result in the recipe. And uh, uh, finally, erythritol doesn't have any um, uh, different flavor. It's uh, very similar to, to sugar, to sucrose. Now you raise a good point. Uh, and one of the reasons, just to further my comments uh, that we were focusing on the beverages is in um, semi-solid, in particular solid matrices, food matrices, um, it becomes a bit trickier because you're replacing gram amounts of sugars with milligram amounts of sweeteners. And necessarily, and I think this is what Jenny was raising too, necessarily you get more of the other components that come up. So that's the refined starches that are part of, let's say a grain-based dessert. So the calories don't really change in the end. Um, if you take something like chocolate, I remember uh, France Belil showed this, you take a, a low calorie sweetened chocolate, um, the energy is almost identical because the fat that comes up by taking out the sugar wipes out any caloric benefits. So the, the solid matrix, you know, the solid foods are, are a lot trickier. And that's the other reason we really wanted to focus on one food matrix and really get the evidence clear there, which was beverages, which is the most important source. And then when it gets to like those food-based approach, like you're talking about, then I think that's probably more of a place for sugar alcohols. Others, we can do gram for gram. Otherwise you'd have to use fiber or other things with the high intensity sweeteners to get that caloric displacement. <clears throat> Yes, I agree. Thank you very much. Hi, thank you for the talk. I'm Jennifer from University of Toronto in Canada. Um, I was curious if you um, knew what the global trends of the intakes of non nutritive sweeteners are. So we, we looked into it for Canada and a few other jurisdictions. It, a lot of this is proprietary. It's hard to get this information, um, but it looks to be across different, you know, certainly Europe, Canada, US, Australia, but a lot of other countries, the most prevalent sweetener would be our blends. And it's going to be ACE, K and aspartame, I think are the two top ones. And then sucralose, I think is third, which is often blended as well with those. But I think the top are aspartame and ACE, K. Um, and my understanding, I mean, we may have some industry here that can comment that these, it, it, it is growing. Well, I can talk for Denmark at least, but there's a growing uh, consumption of non-caloric sweeteners. And stevia has become quite popular uh, after it was allowed, of course. Yeah. Thank you. Yes, um, thank you for your presentations. I'm home from Hedo University, Thailand. So you know that right now the WHO have the recommendation for the using the FOB nutrition labeling, especially for the healthier choice of like uh, nutrition score, for example. And you know that we have a movement in the food industry to reduce the sugar in the sweet beverage. And after this one, the food industries have to remove and they have to change the sugar with the non-nutritive sweeteners. And we see that we have also the changings, the movement of the using non-nutritive non-nutritive sweeteners in the sugar beverage. So what do you think about this policy? Because I, where, where the uh, WHO do not recommend the non, using the non-nutritive sweeteners to replace um, the sugar, right? But we also have an, another way, we have the movement of using non-nutritive non sweetener in the food industry due to by the FOB nutrition labeling. So do you have any idea or do you have any think about either about this one? Yeah. Uh, your specific example, I'm not aware of, but I know that this is a big issue because part of how this guidance is being interpreted from the discussions I've been having, and I was in Oman in September where with WHO when they were with the Ministry of Health, um, and they were talking about taxation being equal both for the low and no calorie sweetened or the non nutritive sweetened beverages and the sugar sweetened beverages, and trying to find based on the WHO guidance, you know, where where the the right path was. And, and I know with Dan, with your PAHO, I think recommendation, there was a recommendation there too, that they would be considered ultra processed. So they would also be subject to public health measures like taxation and, and other things like that. And I think that's where it becomes a bit of an issue similar to this front of pack, like 
it, would it carry it or not and, and how would it look? Yes, absolutely. The non-nutritive uh, sugar sweeteners will be captured in front of Park Liebling. I see Mary's here and she <laughs> knows a lot more, a lot more than, about this than I do. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. Um, this is Mary Labbe, University of Toronto. Um, I think with the front of pack labeling, it varies by different countries. Um, obviously, Chile was the first one, and they talk about the sugars, the saturated fats, and the sodiums and calories on their front of pack. They did see an increase in non nutritive sweeteners. And with the PAHO recommendations of the PAHO nutrient profiling model, asked to it was really focused on trying to eliminate ultra processed foods. And one of the triggers of an ultra processed food is the addition of food additives, which includes non nutritive sweeteners. So with the evidence that came out of Chile, one of the most recent countries, for example, that's introduced front to pack labeling is Mexico. And so now they have put that qualifier in and are also identifying those that have had non nutritive sweeteners. So where that ends up, and that was to sort of counteract the high prevalence of the increased in incidence of non nutritive sweeteners being used in those foods. So um, right now, not many other countries are doing that yet, identifying them, but you know, I think it was a lot of it is the countries are sort of as there more and more countries are in. There's about oh, I guess a dozen of them. So now with mandatory front of pack labeling in various stages of approval. So um, it'll you know quickly evolving space right now, but not many of them have non nutritive sweeteners identified yet. Yeah, I don't know the answer. I'm I'm wondering. I guess it would be interesting to follow the data. Does that counteract? The reduction in sugars because then both are taxed so who cares or does it lead to displacement activity that may not be helpful i don't know i think the data from chile showed that the front of pack labeling was much more effective at reducing consumption than taxation was so i mean it was just more powerful with consumers than the actual taxation in terms of changing sales data um but i think one of the things and i think you alluded to and i think it's an important question here is the real distinction now we're starting to see that's coming apart between foods and beverages. And I'm wondering if you want to speak to that because most of front of pack labeling will appear on foods. And I think you want to speak to that because I think that's where you're le less likely to see the, the positive improvements of using non nutritive sweeteners as substitutes for sugars because most cases you're being added with starches or added fat and very little changes in the calories. And as your data is showing, you know, it's pretty careful pretty clear that it's a displacement of sugars. And I wonder if you want to speak to that because I think most of front of pack labeling will appear on the food products of the sweeteners, of like free sugars. Yeah, I'll probably just reiterate what I said, but I don't know if you've got a comment too, Anne, but I think, yeah, with, with a solid food matrix, I think it, it does become a challenge. I think that it's a technological challenge that I think I know Tate and Lyle and others were going to, were using fiber and other ways of, so that you weren't getting that rise in the refined starches or maltodextrins to so you'd still get some caloric displacement, but I think it's, can it really change the energy density in those foods is, is an issue. And in a lot of cases it doesn't, uh, and you get maybe a halo for this food because it's now they can market it as low in sugars on the label, but it's actually more glycemic and equal amount of calories. And if people over consume it because they think it's healthier, then obviously that's not going to have the intended benefit. Yeah, I completely agree. I probably the biggest potential for the, for the sweeteners are in, or is in the, in the beverages because it, it is very difficult with the food products. We have our industry partners also in the sweet project and they have been struggling to not, uh, well, to keep calories down or energy down when they take up the sugar uh, because they have to add something else in order to make the, the texture and the palatability and the well everything surrounding the food product. So this may be a place where we heard about sugar alcohols. There's also, it's approved in the United States, not in Canada and other jurisdictions, but, and we've done some work on it. So I should mention it, allulose, which is a apomer fructose, which is low calorie, virtually no calorie but has all the functional technological capabilities of sugar and you replace gram for gram. So it's uh, it means that you're not getting that, those refined starch and other things coming up in a product, but you can still have the same sensory experience. It can still be prepared and cooked in the same way and you don't lose any of that. So I think products like that, which are not considered a non-nutritive sweetener, they're called like a non-caloric sugar, um, I think are interesting areas that may be, but again, those would need to be evaluated uh, individually, I think. <clears throat> 
John, I wonder if we could just follow up that um, that question with with another sort of a, a, a sort of a broader question, where there's been a real demonization of carbohydrates and sugars in particular, uh, and related primarily to the obesity epidemic. Um, I wonder if you could talk to the source of sugars, this publication that you put out just just months ago. I think that's really important. It sort of speaks to separating beverages from foods. Um, and I think because there is a real concern about sugars, even in fruits, people, some people don't want to have, you know, don't want to consume fruit or, or, or dried fruits because they're deemed to be high in sugar. They contain sugar. Yeah, the, the food source of sugar is an important one. And that's really what got our interest in the low, no calorie sweeteners uh, as a replacement for sugar sweetened beverages and why we focused on sugar sweetened beverages. So we did a series of reviews that were funded through the Canadian Health Research and Diabetes Canada looking at food source and the trials and the cohorts. And the signal that we saw overall is really, it's where they're providing excess sugars, but in particular, it looks to be a sugar sweetened beverage signal. That's where the evidence is. And even if you look at the reviews of WHO or of uh, the Dietary Guidance for Americans Committee report, the evidence that they really marshal that they have in the narrative relates to sugar sweetened beverages. That's where the evidence is coming from. You don't see it when we look at solid food sources, particularly if you think something like a semi-solid, like yogurt, we don't see it. We don't see it for fruit, which is actually protective in almost every case. Um, and even in some cases, cereals uh, show protective signals in the in the cohorts. So it's really the beverages that are that sort of lone signal that are showing, uh, that are coming out. Even fruit juice at lower doses, we don't we don't see it at the higher doses we do, but sugar sweetened beverages, it tends to be more of a linear relationship and it, it's a clearer one. Um, and I think it's important to make the distinction between the different food sources. And I think that because that's the target and that's where the evidence is, that's what we need to replace. And that's why we wanted to really also focus on low and no calorie sweetened beverages in our analysis for ESD, because it was really like, how do we pair that with our sugar reduction recommendation that focuses on sugar sweetened beverages? <clears throat> As a general question, um, I wondered to what extent um, studies have looked at age as a factor. So early introduction of non-sugar sweeteners and how that relates to a, um, adverse outcomes in childhood and then later on in, in life. So the long-term sequelae of, of early exposure to non-nutritive uh, non uh, sugars. I'll just say with, with the ASD, we were focusing on adults. Um, we, we've looked at the data in kids as well. Um, when you look at the totality of it, when it's analyzed and, and some guidelines groups have looked at it, overall, it doesn't show a, an overall benefit when looking at all the trials. But if you look at some of the best design ones, and I think of the drink trial uh, done by DeRoyter et al., uh, Martin Catan, um, a really carefully done study over 18 months um, in, in a lot of kids that were consumers of sugar sweetened beverages, that was the entry criteria, and then they were randomized to get those or to get the sweetened product. And it was actually provided and they had a biomarker of intake. So they knew they were consuming them. They looked at the, uh, the sucralose and ACE K in, in the urine. Um, when you look at that study, you did see less weight gain with the kids that had those than the sugar sweetened beverage. And some of the other were more um, community-wide sort of interventions that were not as rigorous, um, but maybe still informative because it means if we do these things in the community, we probably need a lot of support to actually get the changes. But overall, I would say we're not seeing signals for harm from the, that trial evidence. For the best designed of them, I think we're seeing a benefit potentially and that you get less weight gain. You saw the same with the Harvard trial by Ebling with David Ludwig. There they gave water or a low and no calorie sweetened beverage. And unfortunately, they didn't give analysis that told us separated the two. But uh, that intervention by giving either one, so whatever the preference was, which goes to values and preferences, you know, if a kid wants to try water or a sweetened product, they did see a benefit there as well, where they provided it for the first year, but it was kind of lost out to two years where they just followed them after the fact. But I think it just shows that we need a lot of support and we don't have the, um, we, need, we need a bit more data to really, I think, understand that. It's a good question, data and kids, yeah. Actually, in the sweet in the sweet project, we tried to recruit ch children in the family context. It was extremely difficult. The, there are many beliefs and myths around uh, non-caloric sweeteners, and and I think parents are they just didn't want their children to participate in such trials. And that was in uh, Spain, Denmark, the Netherlands, and uh, Greece. We had these uh, problems. So, so we need the data, but it's not so easy to create the data, at least not in an RCT. Yeah. 
<laughs> Maybe Europe is different. Thank you. World Health uh, Organization suggests to substitute sugar with uh, natural fruit. Uh, and um, I see that uh, several industries use concentrated uh, fruit juice to substitute sucrose. But uh, we know that uh, fructose is um, worse than sucrose for metabolic syndrome. So uh, I don't think it's a good idea to suggest industry to substitute sucrose with concentrated fruit uh, juice. What do you think about it? I don't think it's a problem in the, the amounts that are used. I think you need to have a very large amount of fructose and exceeding probably energy balance or yeah energy needs to have any detrimental effects on the, well, lipogenesis, for instance. Yes, in uh, in uh, jams or marmalade, for instance, they they put uh, the same amount of sugar with uh, the um, uh, concentrated uh, fruit juice. So the amount is more or less the, the same of uh, sucrose. So I we, we looked at the fructose question carefully too, uh, with the CIHR funded project. And, and we found really fructose only showed its signals and provided excess calories at extremely high doses. Um, so it's it's a question, I think, of dose, uh, as Anne mentioned. I think it's useful, like what they're doing in Canada, which I think is useful, is you're grouping sugar sources on the label. So I think it's just making the consumer aware that this is a source of sugars that have been added to increase the sweetness of the product so that it doesn't you know get sort of missed in, in the product gets a halo so i think that's fair that the consumer be advised of that but i'm I, I like Anne. i'm not that concerned about the amounts even fruit juice for example the level it's consumed at the low levels which is in the population is i think it's still less than 100 mils per person at 125 150 level obtainable from fruit we actually see protective signals in the cohorts it's only when it goes up above that that you see increased risk that's for 100 fruit juice because you have all the uh, bioactives that are still there so I, I think the dose does matter. Um, I don't think the jams quantitatively are, add so much to the diet that they're really a concern. They could be for some people, and then I think they, they'd have to evaluate that. But I, I think the dose matters here. And beverages, you can get bigger doses, and I think that's the target. Thank you very much. Well, this is a really, really interesting conversation. We've uh, we've gone through the guidelines. We've gone through some of the the, the challenges with the guidelines. Some of the uh, and John has nicely tangled untangled uh, some of the the evidence and um, and identified some of the gaps. And we've, uh, thank you all for your questions. And um, um, we see how this evolves. Um, hopefully, the consultations the the, consult the WHO. Um, um, public consultations have ended, I think. So yeah, so we'll see September, right? So we'll see how this evolves and um, and, and uh, what guidelines, what the final guidelines say. Thank you all very much. Thanks to the speakers. Thank you, the audience. Thank you.